Hello and welcome to another episode of the Closure Pills screencast. This is episode number seven, is dedicated to a function about vectors called subvec. This um, and the other episodes of the screencast are based on uh, uh, the book I'm writing, the Closure Standard Library and Annotated Guide by Manning. This is the link to the book. If you enjoy the content of the screencast, you uh, probably enjoy the content of the book too. So give it a look. And uh, that is my Twitter handle, at Reborg, if you have any question. So, subvector. Um, there are uh, uh, sequence processing functions in the Closure Standard Library, which are very popular in my very, uh, very well used already, like map, filter, reduce. And these functions are sequence in, sequence out functions. So if you pass a vector to one of these functions on uh, the left column, you will get back a sequence. And uh, in some cases, this is perfectly uh, acceptable. Uh, in some other cases, though, you might need to pass the vector farther down for uh, other processing. You might need the vector for the constant time access by index or other reasons. So you don't want those um, uh, transformation into sequences and perhaps uh, back into vectors. Um, for these reasons, in the standard library, there are other functions uh, which have a very similar name like map v filter v, reduce kv, and these functions are vector in, vector out functions th that are not transforming the type, are keeping the vector type. Um, there are no, I mean, for each of the sequence functions, uh, there is not always a corresponding uh, vector function, like for example, remove, we don't have a remove v, or rest next, we don't have a rest v, next v. Um, we can simulate those, though, um, with uh, the help of subvec. So let's have a look at subvect. So we can uh, invoke subvector on a vector. Uh, we can use two indexes, a start and uh, an end index. Uh, the end index is optional. If you don't pass it, it will just take count v, the number of elements in the vector. So uh, subvec of a vector n1 is pretty similar to do uh, rest v, so give me all the vector except the first element. If you course, of course pass the second, um, the second index, the end index, it will take the vector up to the index you uh, pass. And there is a relationship between the created subvector and the underlying vectors it was created from. So there are uh, not very many types of vectors in closure, but there are differences between them. And one of them is a vector of primitives that you can create with vector of. And if you create a subvector based on a vector of, then you'll get the semantic of a uh, vector of primitives instead of a, a normal persistent vector of references. Uh, for instance, you can see this if you try to conj um, the letter A into this subvector, it will be translated into the ASCII table uh, correspondent of the letter A97 uh, because there is an implicit cast uh, from uh, a, car, a char to uh, the integer. And for the same reason, <coughs> if you try to conjoin a nil, which is a reference, it will go into uh, not very clear null pointer exception to mean that you are not allowed to uh, uh, add something that is not, not a primitive to this vector or it, can be not, it can't be cast to an integer. So how can we use subvector? There are, I have a three, three examples, uh, an increasingly more complicated three examples to show you today. Um, we can start with something that can be helpful to remove elements from a vector. Uh, this remove at is simply taking two slices of the vector and just leaving out the contiguous element you don't want. In this case, it's just a single element uh, at index edx that is left out. So if you do, if you evaluate this remove at, uh, 
you can see that the resulting vector is missing uh, the element at index 3, where uh, index are zero based on vectors. And uh, uh, the final vector that you see is just a conjoined uh, vector that you obtain when you um, con when you conch, uh, oh sorry, when you uh, put the first subvector into, sorry, the second subvector into the first vector. And the second example is showing you how you can uh, loop recur or iterate using vectors without ever translating to sequences. So this is a very common thing to do with sequences. You loop recur on a sequence, you do something with the first element, the head, and uh, you recur with the rest of the sequence and you do it again until some exit condition is met. The exit condition here is when the vector is empty, the count is zero, and what we are doing is calculating the norm of a vector, which is uh, simply um, summing up the square of the elements of the vector. And at the end, we are doing the square root, um, the sorry, the power of the vector. And at the end, we are doing the square root of uh, the final sum. Um, in order to do this, we are um, using a couple of helper functions that are just uh, there to show you that they are similar to uh, getting the first element from a vector and the rest uh, from a vector, and we call them uh, first v and rest v, and they are just wrapping on nth and subvec. When we use them here, we are recurring on the rest of the vector, and we are doing something with the head of the vector. When uh, when the exit condition is met, the square root is executed. So. If we want to see what is the norm of 3 and 4, it's going to be 5, and you can see down there the result. The final example is a little more complicated. It's, it's using code that is coming, is private functions that are coming straight from uh, reducers.clj. So this is all the plumbing necessary to send uh, fork join tasks onto the fork join pool from Java, the, the util concurrent. So we, we don't need to go into the details of how this is obtained. We are just going to use these primitives in uh, this new function called pmapv. Um, the name is going, is invoking, is, sorry, is uh, similar to another function that is already in the closure standard library working on sequence called the pmap, which is parallel map. If we wanted to create a parallel map that only works, that works on vectors without any translation into sequence, we could write something like this. And we need a number, a minimum number of slices to split our vectors into. And that is based on the number of available cores. Because the idea is to have uh, some large vector uh, and some computationally intensive function f. Uh, since executing this in, in a sequence, sequentially, is going to execute on a single thread, uh, single core, if we can uh, parallelize this work into multiple cores, with, uh, this is probably going to be faster than executing it sequentially. And in order to do that, we need to understand how many uh, slices we want to execute in parallel at each time. And one good uh, number for that is taking the number of available core and on my laptop we are talking about four cores and adding plus two to that and this way you will keep the pool busy executing uh, at least six tasks sorry executing at least four tasks in parallel and with a couple of them in the queue waiting to execute and keep the all the cores busy and you can pass a different n as an argument, and this is because uh, if uh, the kind of problem, and especially uh, the computational profile of f requires the slices to be slightly bigger or slightly smaller, you can uh, pass a different n and experiment with that. So how does it work? It is a recursive function that is going to execute pmap v itself again until we reach an like exit condition that in this case is if the incoming vector, uh, the number of elements in the coming vector is less than the number of slices we want, uh, 
then it's time to actually do the computation and we are just uh, delegating down to map V to do this computation. And But before we do that, we need to splice uh, these vectors until we can execute the, until we can do the final execution. In order to do that, there is a default uh, cond here, an else, that is roughly taking uh, the two halves of the originating vector with sub vec, and it's creating a future task to execute as a, a fork join task, which is the recursion that we need. And this is how, do, how we use those primitives. We fj invoke on uh, a function on the first vector and the corresponding task on the second vector, on the second split of the vector. And we send that to the fork join queue and this specific task instead will take care of uh, joining the results of the second task back into the results of the first task. To verify that everything is working as expected, so let's evaluate pmapv. And I prepared a, a simulated computational intensive f called slow ink that is incrementing n, but is adding a bonus 10 milliseconds each time it's doing that, and that is making it quite slow. If we try that sequentially, we can see that it's gonna take um, a little more than 10 seconds to execute on 1,000 uh, elements in the vector. And we can see after that, that if we go parallel with the same kind of operation, it's roughly one fourth of the entire time taken by the sequential operation, which is what we expect to see. Of course, based on the function, the computational profile of the function f, this might be different. The important thing to understand is that like pmap, you want to use pmap v, the version, the vector version of pmap, uh, where you have uh, computationally intensive functions to execute on a potentially large vector. If uh, we take just ink instead of slow ink, then uh, all the plumbing necessary to uh, splice and dice the vector into uh, fork join tasks um, will be uh, taking more time than executing the same operation sequentially, so it's not worth it anymore. Let's have a look at the performance profile of uh, SubVec. So being a view on the underlying vector based on two indexes, start and end, SubVec is a uh, uh, computational profile is constant, so is a big O of one operation. It it is not dependent on the number of elements in the array because in sorry in the vector because it's just taking uh, a view. It's just uh, setting a view on top of that. Um, we can see that. Oh, sorry, and the fact that the subvec is a constant type operation doesn't mean though that it does not. It is not, it doesn't have any cost. Um, to show you that, I prepared a little benchmark here. We are taking the norm function that we saw before, and I made a couple of small changes just to make it very similar to the same function that is not using subvec. So we can just see um, what subvec, just using subvec is adding to the computation of the norm. So what I changed is that I'm, I've added an index that is starting from uh, the total number of elements in the vector less one. And instead of uh, processing the head of the vector, it's processing uh, the tail, and it's then um, returning, like is is sending the next step, is sending a sub vector to the next step that is removed, that has the, the tail removed instead of the head removed. Um, this is then benchmarked with uh, criterion, and we can see how long it takes. Uh, the, second the second version of the norm, uh, with a slightly different implementation, is not using SAVEC and is just using the index to make access to the vector at any index, not just the tail or the head of the vector. And so you can see that we're using peak here and we are using nth here. The difference between peak and nth to access detail of the vector is very small. So it's un we can uh, 
just not consider that, and we can just consider the only difference remaining, which is using some VEC or not using some VEC, as what is going to uh, determine a difference in the benchmarks. So I'll start the second benchmark, and just, just in case you didn't see that, um, the execution time mean for the first norm version that is making use of sub vec is 135 and, and, and decimals microseconds. Uh, the second uh, version that is not using sub vec is about 10 microseconds. So there are, it's 10 times faster, which depending on the problem might be important or not important for you. So uh, the important takeaway here is that um, to understand that sub vec is a constant time operation, but it still has a cost. And depending on the kind of algorithm you have, that cost may be important to you or not. So if there is an alternative uh, way of doing the same operation, you might take that, like in this case, calculating the norm. Uh, final performance consideration is regarding the fact that sub vec is a view on another vector. That means that uh, despite the fact that the two vectors are pretty much isolated. So you create a sub vec, you can conj into it, you can do other things into it, um, and that won't, cha won't change uh, the vector, the originating vector it was created from. There is still some subtle uh, side effects that can happen, and we can see this. I'm going to create uh, a different repo for this, um, where I can control or have a different settings of a Java heap size. So we are creating a, um, a REPL with uh, five, 512 megabytes of heap. So we can show the effect of uh, this side effect on garbage collection. Well, so what we have here is um, an operation that is trying to get two thin slices of a way larger vector and join them together into a final very a uh, very smaller, much smaller vec uh, vector. And it's using this helper function that is just uh, uh, creating uh, a big vector through range and transformation into vector. And as you can see here, we are, we are uh, creating two references to two sub vectors, V1 and V2, and from much bigger vectors, but these two slices are very small, five elements each. And you can see that there is no reference whatsoever to uh, the big vector that is ephemeral, is created to just create a sub vector and then it goes away from the scope of the lab. Despite that, if we try to execute uh, this code, uh, you'll see what happens. But basically what, what's going on here is that despite the fact that we don't have any explicit reference to this big vector, uh, sub vec does. So this V1 and V2 uh, are keeping the entire large vector alive twice, and that is generating, uh, depending on your heap size, it might generate out of memory condition, and you can see that it will appear down below in a second. Um, so you need to pay attention to that, but there is an easy workaround. Uh, if you have this kind of problem, you have, like, you want to create or work with uh, thinner slices of very large vectors, you can maybe transform the sub vector back into another vector. By doing this transformation here, you're getting rid of the reference inside sub vector to the march uh, larger vector. So if we execute this now, um, it's just going to return just fine because by the time this second slice is created, uh, the garbage collector can operate on the first large vector at the top and return the results without any out of memory error. Uh, so I think that's all uh, for this episode. Um, uh, this is uh, the link to the GitHub project that contains the show notes uh, that are going to be uploaded uh, pretty soon. And I hope you enjoyed this episode and until next time, goodbye.